Thank you everyone for standing by. Welcome to the SLB First Quarter Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question, you may press 1, then 0. You will hear acknowledgement that your line has been placed in queue. You may remove yourself from queue by repeating the same 1-0 command. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to James R. McDonald, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations and Industry Affairs. Please go ahead. Thank you, Leah. Good morning, and welcome to the SLB First Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. Today's call is being hosted from Kuala Lumpur following our board meeting held earlier this week. Joining us on the call are Olivia LaPush, Chief Executive Officer, and Stefan Bigay, Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, I would like to remind all participants that some of the statements we will be making today are forward-looking. These matters involve risks and uncertainties that could cause our results to differ materially from those projected in these statements. I therefore refer you to our latest 10K filing and other SEC filings, which can be found on our website. We are under no obligation and expressly disclaim any obligation to update, alter, or otherwise revise any forward-looking statements whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise, except as required by law. Our comments today may also include non-GAAP financial measures, additional details and reconciliation to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures can be found in our first quarter press release, which is on our website. And finally, SLB and Champion X will fire materials related to the proposed transaction with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, including a registration statement that will contain a proxy statement perspective of the parties. Investors and security holders are urged to read those materials once they are available, which can be obtained from the SEC's website and from the company's websites. SOB, Champion X, their directors, executive officers, and certain members of management and their employees may be considered participants in the solicitation of proxies from their shareholders in connection with the proposed transaction. This will be described further in the proxy statement perspective when it is filed. With that, I will turn the call over to Olivier. Thank you, James. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the call today. During my prepared remarks, I will discuss three topics. I will begin by sharing an overview of our first quarter results. Then I will provide an update on the ongoing market dynamics and highlight areas where we anticipate opportunities for further growth. And finally, I will conclude with our outlook for the full year and the second quarter. Stefan will then provide more details on our financial results and we will open the line for your questions. Let's begin. I'm very pleased with our strong start to 2024. Year on year, revenue grew 13% and EBITDA grew in the mid-teens, in line with our full-year financial ambitions. Additionally, we demonstrated the differentiated value we deliver to our customers, the impact of our continued capital discipline and execution efficiency by expanding year on year adjusted EBITDA margins for the 13th consecutive quarter. Internationally, we harness broad-based activity growth, with 21 of our 25 international geo units increasing revenue year on year. Even when excluding the hacker contribution, our international revenue grew by double digits. These impressive results were led by the Middle East and Asia, which exhibited remarkable growth of 29% compared to the same period a year ago. Specifically in the Middle East and North Africa, Year-on-year growth was supported by continued investments in long-cycle developments and capacity expansion projects in both oil and gas across Algeria, Egypt, Iraq, Libya, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. And in Asia, we saw strong activity across the region led by offshore, notably in China, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and India. Meanwhile, in North America, activity remained soft due to weaker gas price, sustained capital discipline, and the effects of ongoing market consolidation. The slower activity contributed to revenue in the region declining by 6% year on year. Next, I will comment on the division's performance. I was very proud 
to see the power of the core divisions continues to drive our performance this quarter. In particular, you may have seen remarkable growth in production systems supported by our one subsea joint venture, and in reservoir performance led by increased stimulation, evaluation, and intervention services. Well construction also delivered resilient growth. I was also pleased to see our core margins visibly expand year on year, and I trust that this will continue as we remain focused on efficiency and value creation for our customers. Turning to digital integration, I continue to follow our performance very closely. Although we expand the typical pattern of seasonally slower start sales to start the year, digital still grew in the double digits year on year during the first quarter, and we expect a visible uptick of digital sales throughout the rest of the year. This will be supported by increased customer adoption and a base load of ongoing projects, as you can see from the quarterly highlights included in our press release this morning. For the full year, we maintain our ambition to grow our digital revenue in the high teens. Overall, I'm very pleased with this strong start to 2024. We will remain focused on the quality of our revenue, capital discipline, and execution efficiency to generate strong cash flows and shareholder returns throughout the year. I want to thank the entire SLV team for delivering this first quarter performance. They continue to operate at the benchmark level for the industry, and I feel privileged to work with such a dedicated and talented team. Next, let me shift into the ongoing market dynamics and how these are creating opportunities for our business. We're in the midst of a unique oil and gas cycle, characterized by strong market fundamentals, growing demand, and an even deeper focus on energy security. As described on several occasions, this cycle continues to display breadth, resilience, and longevity. This is very much the case in the Asia region where we are, where we are hosting this call today. In this context, there are certain priorities that are increasingly critical to our customers. Project life cycle reduction, particularly in exploration appraisal to accelerate time to first gas, of first oil. Capital efficiency in the development phase to set new benchmarks in every basin. Step change in production recovery for producing assets and for unconventional resources. And finally, adoption of digital and AI capabilities to transform operations and use of technology to abate emissions. Against this backdrop, we continue to innovate with our customers through the combination of integration fit for basin technologies and digital, focusing on unlocking value by delivering lower cost and lower carbon barriers. In our core oil and gas business, we are benefiting from these trends with our exposure to the fastest growing and most resilient market. This cycle continues to be defined by broad growth across the international basins, and there is nowhere this is more evident than in the Middle East and global offshore markets. In the Middle East, Countries are investing to increase both oil and gas supplies through the end of the decade. The long cycle nature of the investments provides further confidence in the durability of the cycle, and we look forward to continue working for our customers to deliver on this target. And offshore, many of the FIDs from the past few years have commenced, leading to broad-based activity across Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Europe. SLB has a strong foothold in each of these offshore regions, benefiting from our deep customer relationship, operational performance, and fit for basin solutions. Through our one subsea joint venture, we offer an unmatched port to process offering throughout the full life cycle of offshore assets, and we continue to deliver on a substantial offshore backlog. Now looking at the priorities for producing assets today and tomorrow, we recognize the need to increase our exposure to the production and recovery market including the more resilient OPEX spend as operators work to offset natural decline, extend performance, and maximize the value of their assets. Our acquisition of Champernex will further evolve our portfolio to capture this opportunity with the addition of a leading production chemicals business and well-established artificial list portfolio, with significant benefits to our customers in every producing basin in the world. This will be particularly visible in the offshore environment which requires a higher intensity of production chemicals for flow assurance, reinforcing the long cycle value of our offshore strategy. 
Another notable trend in the market is the enhanced focus on emission reduction and low carbon energy. Our early investments in this space are beginning to deliver promising results, both in the core through our transition technologies and in new energy portfolio, notably in carbon capture and sequestration. CCS is one of the fastest growing and most immediate opportunities to reduce carbon emissions. And we are leveraging our domain expertise and deep knowledge of the subsurface to respond to an increased demand in our storage solutions. At the same time, we're also expanding to address opportunities throughout the CCS value chain. As you saw in our announcement a few weeks ago, we have entered into an agreement to combine our carbon capture business with Acker Carbon Capture and will own 80% of the combined entity. This is an exciting opportunity to bring together our complementary technology portfolio, leading process design expertise and an established project delivery platform to innovate and deliver carbon capture technology solution at an industrial scale. Looking across our broad portfolio, it is clear that our three engines of growth each with differential technology and exciting project pipelines are positioning us for continued performance across all time horizons. Supported by our strong international portfolio and our unique technology-driven approach to North America, we are truly making this investment cycle better for longer. Finally, I will conclude with our outlook for the full year and the second quarter. Based on, on the commentary I've just shared, the ongoing characteristics of the cycle and our strong first quarter results, we remain confident in our full year financial guidance, with strength in international activity offsetting slower growth in North America. In particular, we anticipate the activity momentum in international markets to continue, driven by increasing global demand and an even deeper focus on energy security. The relevance of oil and gas in the energy mix continues to support further investments in capacity expansion particularly in the Middle East, and in long cycle projects across global offshore markets, fully aligned with our international review ambitions. Additionally, we expect to realize further growth in the strengthening production and recovery market as operators work to maximize the efficiency and longevity of their producing assets. Altogether, this continues to present a very strong outlook for our business during 2024 and beyond. Specific to the second quarter, we expect sequential revenue growth internationally in the mid-single digits and North America in the low single digits. We also expect to expand adjusted EBITDA margins by 75 to 100 BPS. By division, we expect sequential growth to be laid by digital integration, followed by reservoir performance, production systems, and well construction, all of which are rebounding from the conclusion of winter season 80. I will now to, to turn the call over to Stefan. Thank you, Olivier, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First quarter earnings per share, excluding charges and credits, was 75 cents. This represents an increase of 12 cents when compared to the first quarter of last year. In addition, during the first quarter, we recorded one cent of merger and integration charges associated with our 2023 acquisition of the Acker subsea business. Overall, our first quarter revenue of 8.7 billion increased 12.6% year on year. Excluding the impact of the Acker subsea acquisition, revenue increased 6.5% when compared to the same quarter last year. International revenue was up 18% year on year and more than 10% when excluding the contribution from Acker, driven in particular by year-on-year -year growth of 29% in the Middle East and Asia. North America revenue decreased 6% year-on-year, primarily due to lower recount in U.S. land, and the effect of lower gas pricing, which impacted our APS project in Canada. Company-wide adjusted EBITDA margin for the first quarter was 23.6%, up 51 basis points year on year. In absolute dollars, adjusted EBITDA increased 15% year on year. This is in line with our guidance for adjusted EBITDA to grow in the mid-teens for the full year of 2024. 
Our free tax segment operating margin increased 95 basis points, driven by strong incremental margins internationally. Let me now go through the first quarter results for each division. First quarter digital and integration revenue of 953 million increased 7% year on year. As digital revenue experienced double digit growth while APS revenue was flat. Margins declined 300 basis points year on year to 26.6% due to the effects of higher APS amortization expense and lower commodity prices on our APS project in Canada. Margins for the digital and integration division are expected to improve in Q2 and throughout the rest of the year, as digital sales will increase sequentially in line with the usual seasonal trends. Reservoir performance revenue of 1.7 billion increased 15% year on year due to strong stimulation activity particularly in Middle East and Asia, and offshore. Margins expanded 356 basis points as compared to the first quarter of last year to 19.7%, driven by higher activity and improved pricing. Well, construction revenue of 3.4 billion increased 3% year on year as international growth of 9% was largely offset by lower revenue in North America. Margins of 20.5% were essentially flat year on year. Finally, production systems revenue of 2.8 billion increased 28% year on year. Excluding the effects of the acquired Acker subsea business, production systems revenue grew 6%, driven by strong international sales. Margins of 14.2% expanded 490 basis points year on year, driven by a favorable activity mix, strong execution, and pricing improvements. Now turning to our liquidity. During the quarter, we generated 327 million of cash flow from operations, free cash flow of negative 222 million was slightly better than the same period last year. These cash flows reflect the seasonal effects of the payout of our annual employee incentives and lower cash collections following very strong receivable performance in the fourth quarter of last year. Consistent with our historical trend, free cash flow is expected to be higher in the second quarter and to continue to increase in the third and fourth quarters. Capital investments, inclusive of CAPEX and investment in APS projects and exploration data, were 549 million in the first quarter. For the full year, we are still expecting capital investments to be approximately 2.6 billion. During the quarter, we repurchased 5.4 million shares for a total purchase price of 270 million. As we disclosed a couple of weeks ago, we have raised our 2024 target for total returns of capital to shareholders from 2.5 billion to 3 billion. This 3 billion will be evenly split between dividends and share repurchases. Lastly, we plan on filing our S4 registration statement relating to the Champion X acquisition in the next couple of weeks. The transaction will require the approval of Champion X shareholders. During the period after Champion X mails its proxy for the merger until its shareholder vote, we are required to suspend our share buyback program. While this will not impact our total share repurchases for the year of approximately 1.5 billion, it will potentially result in our buybacks being more heavily weighted towards the second half of the year. I will now turn the conference call back to Olivier. Thank you, Stéphane. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are opening the floor to your questions. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, you may press 1, then 0 on your telephone keypad. And our first question comes from James West with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, uh, Olivier and Stefan. Good morning. So, Olivier, I, I know you alluded to it earlier, and you and I have had conversations about the cycle um, recently as well. Uh, but how are you thinking about in, in the last, you know, six, eight weeks or so as we've seen, you know, just increased amounts of contracts and rig awards and, and subsea equipment awards? Um, how are you thinking about uh, where we are in this cycle today and the duration of the cycle? Because it seems to me we're, you know, right now it's a, it's a Middle East, uh, Asia and offshore story, but could, it was certainly going to broaden out to more regions as, as well. So I'm curious to kind of get your your big picture, high level thoughts. No, thank thank you, James. So f from our perspective, I think first and foremost, I think the cycle attributes that we have um, described earlier, uh, the breadth, the resilience, the durability, or the longevity of the cycle are are fully in place and are driven by combination of strong fundamental energy demand, oil and gas demand, if anything, is training upwards from the revision. Energy security is still on top of the agenda. There is no other place than Asia to realize this on the ground. And as such, I think the base of activity is being um, supported by very uh, uh, critical flow of investment, both, as you said, um, in capacity expansion, which is already committed, but also I think in uh, short cycle and long cycle offshore, deep water and shallow. And I think uh, I was here in, in Asia and it's uh, remarkable to see uh, the breadth, the diversity of the opportunity, the number of country, um, offshore, onshore, uh, the new exploration and appraisal cycle, the new entrants that are coming in Southeast Asia, they were not before, to invest because they are looking for securing gas supply, and they are looking to participate to uh, maintain uh, oil, uh, oil production. So I believe that if you combine this with um, what is happening in North America, which is uh, North America operating within a threshold, and not necessarily uh, with uh, significant anticipation of uh, supply uh, growth in that market in short term, uh, this is only accentuating the characteristics of the cycle international. And you can, if I can reflect from the last uh, two or three months of a lot of customer engagement, um, the sentiment is uh, trending uh, more positively than it was maybe six or 12 months ago. And customer engaging to secure capacity on long projects such as uh, deep water and subsea, and they are looking for partnership collaboration to make sure that uh, we help them uh, into securing the best capital efficiency as I, as I highlighted look for integration to accelerate the, the project cycle uh, to get faster to first oil, first gas. So if anything, I think um, I see more uh, uh, the stronger pipeline of uh, projects that will help us uh, help this cycle to prolong beyond what we could anticipate a year ago. Right. Got it. Okay. Makes a, makes a lot of sense. And then maybe just as a, as a follow-up on the, the digital side and the, and the, the rollout of, of the Delphi, uh, Delphi platform, um, how do you feel about the progress that's happening there, the adoption by customers? I know you've got a, you know, a good number of customers so far, but still the penetration is probably uh, not nearly where it will be in you know, three to five years, but um, it's a powerful tool. And so how, how, how do you see adoption trending from here? I think the, the adoption continues to trend favorably. I think uh, you'll continue to see as we deliver quarter after quarter uh, uh, a both set of announcements in digital operation, in cloud adoption for geoscience workflow, or in data and AI. You have, you have seen the diversity of what you announced this quarter. Uh, do expect the same next quarter and, and the following quarter. Uh, because we believe that uh, customers are realizing that they need to unlock efficiency um, and uh, they need to accelerate the cycle and they need to extract uh, lower carbon solutions for their assets. So this is pulling. 
So we are still, and we have renewed our ambition and target to reach or exceed high teens uh, for digital growth this year. And uh, we started the year, I would say, uh, considering the seasonal low on, the, on, the, on teens, uh, low teens uh, growth year on year, uh, double digits, that is, uh, was fully aligned with what we have, could have anticipated, and uh, it will continue. So I see uh, quarter after quarter expansion of digital uh, adoption, and I see uh, more and more contribution from digital operation, uh, be it uh, drilling automation, be it uh, production uh, uh, operation uh, uh, solution, and uh, you will see that in the coming quarter, and uh, the upcoming uh, transaction with Champernex will only strengthen this uh, production operation offering, as it will complement and give us a, 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 another platform to expand our digital adoption. So I'm, I remain uh, very constructive, and I believe that it is a long trend of uh, digital adoption that will continue uh, throughout uh, the rest of the decade. Got it. Perfect. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you, Jen. Next, we move on to David Anderson with Barclays. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Olivia and Stefan. Morning, Dave. Morning. Um, so just a question on kind of the timing of the Champion X deal um, and, and sort of as it relates to where we are in the cycle. So these are all product lines that are targeting, targeting the production side of the well, well life cycle. Primary divers can be OPEX spending, particularly with deep water development ramping up in the coming years. Conversely, conversely the timing of, of acquiring a later cycle company might suggest that your position for upstream spending to structure is slow in the coming years. So, could you just help us understand a little bit of the dynamics as sort of the OPEX cycle and the CAPEX cycle? I totally appreciate the duration of it, but I guess I'm sort of thinking about the sort of the cadence of the different cycles. Can you just help us understand kind of how the timing of that works out? And, and maybe you're just the OPEX cycle expanding higher, but the two dynamics I think are causing a little bit of um, questioning in the market, I guess, today. Yeah, no, it's a fair question. And I think first, first and foremost, stepping back in time, I think uh, we have been, uh, as we prepare our core strategy a few years back, we identified that uh, pollution recovery, in particular uh, pollution chemicals, reservoir chemicals, uh, leaf solution will be a domain where we need to invest technology and we need to explore opportunity to accelerate our market uh, participation because we believe uh, two things. We believe first that uh, this market will benefit from further innovation, from further integration, from further uh, disruption, and hence uh, create uh, through OPEX uh, 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 the efficiency gains into uh, production operation, into recovery. And we believe that uh, the market is discovering to some extent, has discovered, but has uh, an opportunity to exploit more of these uh, pollution chemicals, more of this optimized uh, uh, full-life uh, leaf solution, and combined with digital. So we believe that, all in all, uh, this market is not only an OPEX versus CAPEX. This market is uh, uh, responding to uh, increased demand and increased opportunity we see in the market that has been there uh, growing and uh, for which we are willing to respond. And the customer feedback on the engagement we've had uh, realizing the potential of what we can put together from technology, from workflow integration, from uh, automation, and from optimization from domain reservoir knowledge to process equipment will clearly create uh, a new leg into, uh, into the technology deployment and into the efficiency of producing assets. So and I will not try to oppose APEX APEX. I will just say that uh, production recovery is becoming critically. Uh, it has been for the last few quarters is increasingly become part of the priority of our customers. Now, we believe as well that this market has further resilience uh, because uh, the market, every liquid uh, produced in the world, more or less demands uh, an element of uh, production chemicals to, to, uh, to assure its uh, resilience in production. And at the same time, we believe that as the long term, the, uh, the, uh, most of the assets will see a higher water cut and some of the assets will see a more complex uh, reservoir fluids coming up uh, to the process facility. There will be an increasing need to uh, adding more uh, sophisticated and more technical pollution chemicals to the flow. So all in all, an opportunity today and a resilient outlook for tomorrow. 
So it, it's not so much you see upstream CapEx slowing, it's just more that you see OpEx side increasing and more technology increasing. That's exactly, like that. how, how exactly. Okay. I see mm -hmm. what we see and the engagement we have customer, we see that uh, they're in their quest for pollution recovery opportunity, we see that the combination of uh, pollution chemicals, uh, digital capability, including optimizing some uh, production uh, lift solution and other uh, intervention, is in dire need for uh, uh, modernizing uh, innovation and automation. And we believe that the addition of this to our portfolio, the significant talent and capability we are getting through the addition of Champonex will help us fast track this uh, new path of, uh, of uh, pollution recovery market expansion. That would be a combination of OPEX and CAPEX. And OPEX will only supplement and, uh, and add uh, opportunity for growth and it is not at all relating to the, where we are in the cycle for CapEx. Understood. And then, so it, just as a follow-up on the Champion X deal, I, I was surprised to see you announce 400 million in synergies for a company that was as well-run as Champion X is. Can you help us break that down a little bit more? Like, where do you see the greatest opportunity on the cost side? And also, if you could expand the revenue synergy side. You know, to be honest, we hear about revenue synergies all the time, but often they don't materialize. So. What's different here in Champion X where you have more confidence on the revenue synergy side? So, so Dave, yeah, thanks for the, the question. The, so again, yes, 400 million of annual synergies, which we think we can achieve in the first three years. And as we said, 70 to 80 percent achieved in the second year, which makes the, the transaction accretive to earnings per share in, the, in, in year two. So, so now we have the, the full integration team uh, in place, refining estimates, going through uh, all the buckets of synergy. So I'm, I'm not going to give you definitive numbers, but as a, as a rough split, the most of the synergies, most of the 400 million synergies, let's say about 75% of it is, uh, is related to costs and 25% related to, uh, to initial revenue synergies. So of the 75% cost synergies, again, an approximate 75%, you can say that roughly half of that is on, uh, is on our own SLB uh, spend. Uh, we mentioned earlier, we spend a lot of, uh, of chemicals, for example, for over operations and with the manufacturing and uh, internalization of, uh, of uh, spend we can do with Champion X, we think we can have uh, great savings there. And, and the over half or so of the, of the cost synergies would be GNA and, and over operating cost uh, savings, if, that's mm -hmm. if that helps. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Next, we move on to Arun Jayaram with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Good morning, Olivier. I wanted to get your perspective on the spending picture in Saudi Arabia and the potential impacts from, from SLB, uh, given the decision to maintain their maximum uh, spare capacity at 12 million barrels, uh, but, but obviously a shift to higher levels of gas development. And I was just wondering also if you could maybe address just the recent de decision to suspend uh, some shallow water drilling uh, in the country. Yeah, no, thank you, Aaron. I think, uh, let me first, maybe for simplicity and from uh, aligning the, our views, uh, maybe let me unpack first uh, and give some additional colors on, on this um, rig suspension. And I think uh, these are public data, and I think a total of 20 to 22 rigs are being um, suspended uh, to the various form of consideration. Um, but this is in the context of this um, both Safania and Manifa project uh, all uh, incremental project expansion program that has been suspended. Uh, both of these assets were having a combined um, slightly above 20 jackups operating in these two assets at the end of last year. The anticipation of uh, the additional rig necessary for the expansion will have added another dozen rigs. When you make the math at the end of this year, um, both of these assets will host slightly above uh, uh, 10 to uh, a dozen rigs or a net uh, 10 rigs less than at the end of last year. So that's first what is happening on offshore. You contrast this with the gas market, 
and a decision that was almost coincidental with the MSC decision um, to increase the gas capacity towards 2030 by 60% compared to 2021. This is actually resulting in the total rig activity increase and net rig addition between uh, now and the end of the year of a total approximately uh, almost 60 weeks across, across the, the entire uh, unconventional and conventional, both uh, walkover rigs, uh, cultivating drilling units, and drilling rigs for the unconventional Jafoa and for the, for the uh, 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 conventional gas. So this switch from offshore to onshore, this switch from oil to gas, uh, is actually the execution of the strategy of uh, Saudi Aramco, I believe. And it happened that uh, we have um, market exposure that is long on, the, on land, very long on land, and is balanced and actually long on gas. So as a consequence for us, uh, while this is an activity that uh, has changed and a mix that uh, wasn't anticipated six months ago, um, this will not have natural impact on our ambition for growth for Saudi. This will not change our guidance for New Middle East uh, sustained growth, and this will uh, continue to support our ambition to grow international and hence the fully organic reiterated uh, this morning. Great, that's helpful. And just my follow up, Olivier, could you just characterize the rest of the spending picture in the GCC in the Middle East um, you know, outside of Saudi? Yeah, I think that's a very good point, actually. It's, uh, uh, it, it's very broad growth, uh, it's activity uptick uh, in almost all the country, uh, with po possible exception of uh, uh, Egypt these days, considering the, 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 the cash and devaluation situation. But uh, almost every other country is having a, a very significant growth, and I've been citing a, a few countries this morning, and I could not stop uh, listing all of them, and it includes Qatar, that is starting to now remobilize for uh, addition of uh, the West uh, North Field. Uh, obviously, Kuwait, as we commented earlier, that uh, is coming uh, now very well structured to execute their capacity expansion. Uh, UAE uh, on both gas and oil. Uh, um, Oman, very steady. Uh, Iraq, uh, as you have seen, we have had some uh, nice contract also in that, uh, in that region. So we are uh, very comfortable about the breadth, the diversity, of the activity growth, uh, rig activity growth in the region. And actually, a couple of rigs or more could actually uh, be redirected from the offshore Saudi contract to uh, supplement and to help accelerate some activity in the region, while some others are already uh, being uh, retained to some extent for future activity here in the Southeast Asia. So I believe that uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, as we said earlier, last year broke uh, uh, and had a, a total uh, market spend that was record high. I think this record is just extending this year and uh, with a very good breadth of oil and gas uh, onshore and offshore activity despite the slight change of mix in Saudi. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next, we move on to Neil Mehta with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, th thank you for, for all the strategic comments. I had a couple uh, more uh, financial questions. The first, uh, just the, the second quarter commentary, if I look at Q1, EPS was $0.75, cents, and I think the streets got it moving to $0.84 cents in the second quarter. So just would love your perspective on how we should think about the 2Q versus 1Q build as, as you have pretty good visibility at this point into, into the second quarter. So, so, Neil, as we have mentioned, uh, Q2, we always see uh, the, the, the reversal of seasonality, if you want, and, and very strong margin expansion. So we, uh, we just guided uh, to 75 to 100 basis points of uh, uh, incremental uh, EBITDA margin in terms of, uh, of basis points. And, and the rest below the EBITDA, you can... Uh, you can very well assume uh, to go down to EPS, but uh, non-operating expenses and just about all the rest is, is about the same as, uh, as in the first quarter, if that helps. That helps and dials in pretty well with the street. I, 
I guess the, the follow-up is just on EBITDA margins. It, it did come in a little bit softer than maybe where the street was on, uh, on digital and integration and to a smaller extent on, on well construction. Just love your perspective on, as we work our way through the year, how we should be thinking about EBITDA margins uh, and, uh, and your conviction on, on the recovery there. Thank you. So uh, as Olivier mentioned, it, uh, it has been 13 consecutive quarters that we, we increase EBITDA margins year on year. So it, it was the case in the first quarter as well. And it will be the case in each and every single of, uh, of the remaining quarters of the year. So this, uh, this year on year growth of EBITDA and EBITDA expansion is, uh, is with us for the year. Now you mentioned uh, the DNI margins. As you know, they are uh, typically the lowest in the first quarter of the year, this is mostly the seasonally uh, lower digital sales. This year, it was made worse by uh, lower APS revenue due to, to two kind of related effects, actually. The lower gas pricing in our uh, Palliser Canada assets and, and higher amortization expense per unit of production. So this resulted in a year-on-year -year drop in the total digital and integration margins, but this is entirely due to uh, APS. The digital margins are, are intact. And, uh, and as the rest of the year unfolds, as Olivia mentioned, digital sales will, uh, will increase quarter after quarter. And this will be at, uh, at high incremental margins for digital, considering that most of the costs are, are fixed. So we, we clearly uh, continue to, to shoot for... Uh, Overall, DNI margins above 30 percent on a, on a full year basis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Our next question is from Scott Gruber with Citigroup. Please go ahead. Yes. Hello. Um, I wanted to circle back on the the Saudi morning, comment. We got a good morning. I um, want to circle back on the Saudi uh, comments because a few investors have, have asked for some clarification. Um, Olivia, did you mention that the, the rig growth um, was a net 60, you know, 6 zero, even with the losses of 20 jackups? Yeah, I think that uh, I'm, I'm contrasting, uh, I think, some offset uh, case. So there, there will be increased, uh, there was a plan that has not changed. Uh, for Saudi to accelerate the gas expansion program. What has accelerated and that has improved is the pace of the, this expansion program driven by the raise of 50 to 60 percent target uh, by 2030. And as a consequence of that, the whole year that was based on previous plans but now boosted by this accelerated expansion program will result into a total uh, rigs uh, year on year that will, or from beginning of the year to the end, add 60 rigs in total to the gas market, all, of, all on shore. So that, that's, that's, that's the, the reality of the market. Some of it in unconventional, up to 10 to 15 rigs in unconventional, some of it in the gas conventional, some of it in, uh, in intervention and, uh, and walkover. So that's uh, a total uh, activity that gas is a strong market for, uh, for Saudi, it's becoming a significant market uh, going forward. So that's where we expect uh, um, activity to continue to grow going forward. And we are essentially favorably exposed to this, uh, to this activity set as we have uh, an exposure that uh, goes above. Uh, uh, we are long on gas, as we explained. And uh, hence, we benefit from technology that we have deployed in uh, Saudi that is fit for uh, the Jafwa project technologies such as uh, coal tubing, underbalanced coal tubing drilling solution that is being used on uh, GABA gas, and the technology that we use across for conventional gas in either integrated or discrete contract. So that's the, the benefit we see, and that's the total rig that we see uh, uh, going forward. Well, thanks. That's, that's encouraging. Thanks for, for clarifying that. Um, and then turning back to, to well construction margins, you know, should should we be expecting those you know to uh, to come in about flat uh, for the year? I know they'll improve you know seasonally and, and are always strong in the second half. Um, should we be thinking about kind of flat year on year? Um, and just thinking about the the mix in that business, you know, historically with greater offshore activity and and weaker U.S. onshore activity, 
um, I would just expect those margins to be to be grinding higher. Um, so maybe if you you could comment on um, you know what's kind of keeping those flat year on year. Maybe the mix just isn't that uh, impactful anymore with your new sales strategy in the U.S. But uh, just some some color on the uh, year over year margins and, and well construction would be great. So, so look, they, they were flat uh, indeed uh, in Q1 year on year, but for the full year, you should actually see margin expansion in uh, in well construction. Well, what uh, well, the, the the headwind we have a bit is uh, is the lower activity in North America, so that that kind of masks the uh, the margin expansion internationally. But uh, as we go through the year, you will you will see year on year growth in uh, in well construction. You have timing of certain uh, stuff and adjustments in, on a quarterly basis, but on a year-on-year -year basis, you will clearly see margin expansion coming from uh, international. Okay. And maybe for clarity of, uh, of, the, of, of the split on, on the, the net addition in the, in, in the gas market in, in Saudi, the net addition due to the expansion uh, acceleration uh, is about 20 weeks. Okay, good. Thanks. And half, and the additional a bit more than half of that in the, a little bit more than half of that in the unconventional, and the, and the other and the rest in the uh, in the conventional. So that's the that's the resulting effect of this uh, acceleration of uh, gas expansion into into Saudi. Hence the shift indeed from uh, from offshore to uh, to uh, to uh, onshore and from oil to gas, characterized by this uh, accelerated uh, expansion, translating to 20 rigs and the uh, reduction of the uh, net offshore from end of year last year to end of the year this year that is above above 10. So that's the mix changing for clarity. Okay, got it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Next we go to Kurt Halid with Benchmark. Please go ahead. Hey, hey everybody. Thank you for uh, sliding me in here. Appreciate that. Um, so uh, given the fact that you are currently in Kuala Lumpur and Asia seems to be one of your growth vehicles and something that really hasn't gotten a lot of airtime, uh, just kind of curious as to you know, what you see what you see is uh, driving that, that growth and what regions within Asia do you, do you, is standing out to you? I think great, great question. I think indeed we had a reason to come here. And the reason why first uh, the team has delivered and has been delivering a resilient growth and resilient margin expansion over the last uh, two years since the, the rebound from, uh, from the COVID uh, time. And, uh, and I think we have been observing, supporting uh, the team, but I think uh, spending, uh, spending two weeks in a region, I think is clearly uh, giving us a little bit more spotlight onto the strengths uh, of the region. I think first and foremost, I have to say, this region is characterized by uh, its, uh, the critical uh, um, resource they are putting to support security of supply, partially gas, and uh, investment they are doing to, uh, I would say, to support and stabilize oil uh, production and, and prevent further decline. So stabilizing oil production and accelerating gas is certainly the theme that is common to the entire uh, region. And I think it's further accentuated by uh, energy security and is translating into uh, a new wave of investment uh, it was very telling to, to see that uh, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, uh, in South, uh, in, in offshore uh, uh, China, in Bangladesh, in India, we are seeing new uh, round of uh, exploration appraisal that have not been seen with new entrants into this market that were not there uh, certainly a, a few years back. And I think this is creating a new set of opportunity, uh, both uh, offshore primarily, and uh, some of them in deep water, uh, asset, and I think that will create further opportunity for subsea. And at the same time, as I said and I stress, uh, there is also a, a focus independently on to re uh, supporting and preventing uh, uh, pollution decline for oil. And this is uh, visible across all, uh, all um, assets, both onshore and offshore. And hence, uh, intervention, recovery technology is being pulled uh, to uh, add investment. So you combine this uh, wave of new investment for accelerating gas from exploration to uh, development projects with uh, this uh, uh, intervention recovery focused production on the existing declining assets 
that exist here in all markets in, uh, across the region, and you get the recipe for uh, a significant investment and a steady investment in every, in every country, from Indonesia to, uh, to Malaysia to uh, Thailand, uh, China offshore uh, and onshore, uh, India, Bangladesh, as, as I said, a new country. And I think uh, this, is, uh, this is very interesting and very exciting for the team, and we are responding to this by deploying assets, deploying resources, and, uh, and uh, creating fit technology for the market to help us grow and continue to succeed in this region. That's great. That's great, Keller. Appreciate that. So um, you know, maybe a, maybe a follow up here as you've kind of referenced, uh, you know, significant opportunities to tap into the production spending profile of your customer base, and and hence the the dynamic related to the uh, Champion X, you know, acquisition. Um, you know, when you look at the the production chemicals piece of the business, um, you know, their Champion X is a clear leader there, and and um, just kind of curious as to um, you know, what, is there a lack of better phrase? Is like some secret recipes in production chemicals that that you guys are bringing to the table that could potentially enhance uh, margins and and substantially boost the revenue growth rate or, or boost the Champion X position. I think uh, there are multiple aspects to, to to this. Okay, first and foremost, I think we have been operating also in production chemicals orbit at a, at a smaller scale, international market. We are actually having quite a portfolio in uh, reservoir chemicals uh, that are helping us extract, recovery, and optimize our intervention and stimulation program in, also in international market. And we believe that combining this uh, will help us uh, open uh, and, uh, and uh, compare and optimize fit for reservoir solution, fit for process facility solution. And I think we both are coming from different uh, uh, position of strengths. We have a process portfolio, equipment process portfolio, both onshore and onshore. Uh, we have uh, reservoir chemical and subsurface domain expertise and fluid expertise. And they have obviously fluid uh, and understanding of the reservoir uh, of the production chemistry portfolio. So I think combining both, I think is uh, in our opinion, uh, uh, a unique opportunity and the feedback from customers is indicating that uh, they see a lot of potential in this combination. We will obviously try to add uh, and extend this to a uh, full integrated uh, production solution, including digital, including lift solution, including intervention, and including process equipment optimization that we deliver on FPSO and, and other places. So there is a place where this will have further effect, in my opinion, is in, uh, is in offshore uh, environment. And also we will compare and, and uh, complement each other on trying to find a uh, low carbon and, uh, and, uh, and solution that help also uh, create a further differentiated uh, uh, portfolio, sustainable uh, production chemical portfolio for the market. So we, are, we, we have quite a, an upside uh, in technology in addition to have an upside on, the, on market expansion to use our, our international footprint uh, to complement uh, the strengths of, uh, of Champonex uh, pollution chemical into North America. That's fantastic. Thanks, Olivier. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And, Thank you. And our last question comes from Luke Lemoyne with Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Hey, good evening. Um, Olivier, on carbon capture, understand what SLB is doing and what Augur is doing, but can you help frame how you see this business developing along with how the combination is greater than the two standalone entities? Yeah, good, good, great question. First and foremost, I think we, we see CCS as any the most, um, the most obvious and the most uh, attractive uh, um, market, uh, total addressable market adjacent to our space uh, where we can contribute to uh, uh, decarbonization and, uh, of the industrial, industrial space. So we believe uh, we are first uh, a market position and right of play into the, into the sequestration uh, through our technology, through our digital and solution to deliver uh, uh, not only site selection, but also site uh, uh, characterization and, uh, and development of site for, for, carbon, uh, for carbon sequestration. So that's our, our and, and by doing this, we have significant access to a large number of customers within oil and gas uh, through the hubs and uh, beyond oil and gas to the operator that uh, emitters that are willing to develop. So we have this as a starting point that gives us market access 
uh, across uh, many of the FIDs and many of the projects. And we quoted more than 30 projects were always part of at any point in time. And I think we have had uh, quite a lot of experience there. So we also have invested into capture technology that uh, we have done, such as RTI for non aqueous uh, uh, solvent, which are trying to, where we are trying to disrupt the intention we have to disrupt the economics of capture for low, uh, uh, low, uh, low uh, stream, uh, low concentration uh, stream of uh, CO2 in our to abate sector. But uh, what uh, aqua carbon capture brings into this is a commercial, uh, commercial uh, solution platform already commercialized that uh, will serve us as a, as a base for expansion, for deployment of our capture uh, technology, and uh, also uh, will build on the initial success they have had to deploy this platform onto some European uh, markets and use our footprint where we see the market evolving fast in North America, in Middle East, and in Asia, and uh, using this platform and being the, uh, the, the go-to market for this uh, uh, carbon capture solution that they are offering but supplementing it with our innovation uh, that we are investing and using this as a platform to deploy innovation. So combining sequestration and capture to offer this combined opportunity for the customer as technology solution and using the platform of the commercial uh, carbon capture, aqua carbon capture that exists today and it's commercial and using it as a platform to deploy and, and add and supplement this with uh, new disruptive technology. That's the purpose. And that's the intention we have. That's the, uh, the ambition we have in this market. Okay. And then maybe on North America, it's a smaller piece of your business. But can you talk about how you see it developing over the course of the year past 2Q? Yeah, I think we have been, uh, we have been originally guiding, uh, and we, we are keeping our guidance that we believe that on a full year basis, uh, it would be more muted than uh, we had anticipated at the beginning of the year, considering the softness of the, of the market at the, at the start of the year, the persistent uh, low gas price, the, uh, the capital discipline, and also the, uh, the, uh, the consolidation in the market. And we expect going forward, we gathered uh, uh, low single-digit growth sequentially. Um, we uh, anticipate at the end of the year to still... Uh, uh, outperform the market that will see a uh, year-on-year decline on reactivity uh, by posting uh, uh, muted but positive growth. But the shortfall that we may have concerning this offset uh, will be uh, fully offset by, uh, by international growth, as we commented, where we see uh, uh, resilience and we see uh, further uh, growth potential in uh, many markets. So hence, we have reiterated our full year guidance. Okay, um, great. Thanks, Olivier. Thank and you. We'll turn the conference back to Olivier Lapouche for closing comments. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude today's call, I would like to leave you with um, the following takeaways. First, the global energy landscape remains very compelling for our business. Demand for energy is accelerating, and this is resulting in strong activity dynamics that are closely aligned with our three engines of growth. We will continue to innovate with customers across our core, digital, and new energy to meet this demand in the years to come. Second, SAB remains optimally positioned to harness the ongoing oil and gas cycle for further growth. We operate in the most resilient and fastest growing market internationally. And we have a unique portfolio of technology and service that differentiate us in North America. Together, our unmatched footprint and offerings will continue to set us apart and drive our up performance globally. And third, after a strong start to 2024 and with clear visibility into the year ahead, we look forward to achieving our full year financial ambition and commitment to shareholders' return. This is an exciting time for the industry, and I'm fully confident in our strategy for the future. I could not hope for a better back backdrop to continue delivering for our customers and shareholders. With that, we conclude this morning's call. Thank you all for joining. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.